Now recently, in the 75th issue of the 2018 started Justice League run, DC Comics pulled the laziest trick in the book when you are out of ideas and decided to kill the Justice League, until they are brought back eventually. So, while we wait for that eventuality to happen, let's go back to look at some of the Justice League's golden days with the challenging rivals introduced back in the Silver Age. The Crime Syndicate was first introduced in 1964 in the 29th issue of the original Justice League of America comic as an alternate universe supervillain version of the Justice League. On their home world of Earth 3, since the Justice Society was on Earth 2, history was reversed from our real one and similar to the Mirror Universe in Star Trek, where the heroes were villains and villains were heroes. Or just one villain was a hero since Lex Luthor was the only hero in there. That first version of the Crime Syndicate were the first to die in the first issue of the Crimes on Infinite Earth in 1985, and the second incarnation was introduced in JLA Earth 2 graphic novel written by Grant Morrison with the art by Frank Quitely in the year 2000. Yes, they were originally from Earth 3, but remember that this was in the year 2000 when the DC Universe was going through the post-zero hour world state after Crimes on Infinite Earths. That meant that the multiverse did not exist at the time, and parallel world stories were instead told as alternate timeline stories in the hypertime, and so, for a concrete parallel mirror universe, Grant Morrison chose to use the antimatter universe. With the normal matter universe standing for Earth 1, and the antimatter universe standing for Earth 2. And with that introduction, along with the thumbnail and the video title, it should be obvious that this video is my latest comic to adaptation comparison review for JLA Earth 2 and its inspired movie adaptation Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Going over the source material shouldn't take long, since it is a shortest one-shot graphic novel and thinner than my ring. Future Pika here, by the way. I just got finished recording most of the script into audio narration form like this. I just realized that these narration clips ended up becoming almost 10 minutes long each, so the video will be pretty long. So here are time codes to different sections of the video, so you can, if you don't have it to watch it on the first go, come back and watch it later. And now let's get to recapping the source material for me. JLA Earth 2 begins from the antimatter universe as a ship is seen going in a slingshot around the sun similar to how it was done in Star Trek, with the CSA Trinity observing as it flees away from their reach and commenting about making the most out of the pilot's absence. The ship is shown landing on Earth to a rural area and being approached by two farmers in a familiar homage to Superman's origin, but instead of a baby Kal El, the pilot is revealed to be an adult Lex Luthor who asks the farmers where he can find super people. Meanwhile, based on the fact that there is no indication of time having passed, the Justice League is shown responding to a plane having engine trouble. While the League is able to prevent the plane from crashing, the passengers inside have all unfortunately all passed away from cardiac arrests, with all of them having their hearts on the right side of their bodies. More concerns rise when the Flash goes through everyone's wallets for identifications and finds dollar bills with Benedict Arnold where George Washington should be, then with the plane's black box revealing that the pilot's calls for help were sent for Lex Luthor, and Aquaman finding from the tail section that this was not a commercial flight, but rather a private one for those kinds of southerners. With the Black Box's last call, the Justice League heads to the LexCorp Tower to question Luthor, who has been detained and replaced by the one who just arrived, and is being more benevolent in his behavior to the people he interacts with. When the Justice League arrives, this Luthor gets relatively quickly to his point in admitting his arrival might have been the cause for the plane accident as collateral damage. When Superman responds to this the way he would with his Luthor, the other Luthor then moves into spelling out that he is from another world where good is bad and bad is good, using the plane and his own heart being on the right side as his evidence. 
This buys him a proper invitation to continue this conversation in the Justice League Watchtower. To which before moving to, Luthor gives his secretary a vacation and money that the native Luthor can accuse her of stealing when this is all over. Meanwhile in the Antimatter universe, we are introduced to the crime syndicate and how they are evil. Superman's evil counterpart Ultraman makes it rain with fake money with the intention of crashing the economy and kills anyone calling him out for it with his heat vision. Batman's evil counterpart Old Man throws the police commissioner by killing his loyal officers and having an affair with Superwoman, who is said to be married to Ultraman. Ultraman supposedly knows about their affair, but Superwoman is a strong, toxic woman keeping him pussy whipped and Owlman is implied to have whatever passes for blackmail material in this world to keep himself safe from retaliation. Green Lantern is represented by Power Ring, who is cursed to wield a sentient ring, and the Flash's evil twin Johnny Quick is a speed Jewish junkie. Anyway, around this time Brainiac, whom Ultraman had forced into serving him, has finished its job in calculating Luthor's escape route and verified that he used the technology stolen from Ultraman's floating fortress to safely travel through the barrier between the antimatter and matter universes. Given this knowledge, Ultraman calls the rest of the crime syndicate to inform them about this, and they vote to set their attention into conquering the matter universe once Luthor has returned and been apprehended. Next, our attention shifts back to the Justice League Watchtower in the matter universe, where the other Luthor has nearly finished telling the League how he is the only hero in a world ruled by villains, and that he is literally begging for them to come help him end their tyranny. Batman is the first person to say no, leaning onto the fact that they cannot leave their world behind to go be heroes in some other world, to which Luthor responds at first by reminding that he is the lone hero of his world, and that he only needs their help for 48 hours in fixing things before they can return back. The Justice League then decides to have a meeting to vote on the issue, with the final decision being that Aquaman and Martian Manhunter will stay behind, while Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash and Green Lantern take the 48-hour assignment to the Antimatter universe. As they leave, Luthor tells them that he chose to call the Justice League's world Earth 2, because it was more simple than calling it the Matter Earth or Outer Earth. Now, two decades later after this story's publication, we can all probably know why this name has not aged well. When they arrive and disguise themselves to pass on as civilians, Luthor shows them what kind of world his home is, and Green Lantern almost blows their cover by introducing his ring to stand up to a local who kicked a dog. Meanwhile, Batman goes to see the local police commissioner in Gotham, and due to their mission, is forced to hold back whatever shocked reaction he would otherwise have, as the police commissioner is revealed to be his father, Thomas Wayne, who initially mistakes Batman for Owlman, reveals him to be his son, Thomas Wayne Jr., who blames his father for the deaths of his mother, Martha, and younger brother, Bruce. Okay, quick pause in the story recap, because I have needed to talk about this with someone for uh, some time now. So Owlman is not an evil alternate version of Bruce Wayne. He is the counterpart of Batman's non-existent big brother. This is one great plot point of a missed opportunity that no one after Grant Morrison in this story has decided to explore. The fact that Bruce Wayne was not the only son of Thomas and Martha Wayne, but also not their first son, why has this not been explored more? Or, I mean, Scott Snyder did some effort in it back in 2012, when he was the main Batman writer during the New 52 with Lincoln Mars and the Court of Owls, but that barely got anywhere, and so was subsequently dropped after moving forward with the character. And believe me, I'm going to talk more about this when we get to the animated movie. Batman can only tell Commissioner Wayne that he is not Owlman, and Commissioner Wayne is shown to, at some extent, recognize Batman as his other son, before two officers with shotguns burst into the room and Batman has to leave dropping flashbangs, and promises that the crime syndicate will be taken down in the next 12 hours. Then he regroups with Superman and Wonder Woman on the roof and voices his concerns about how the changes to this world will affect theirs, 
but Clark and Diana are too optimistic to worry about trivial things like that. Superman changes the subject to tell them that Green Lantern is in position to trap the crime syndicate in their moon base with all but Superwoman there to be trapped with the others. And already in the next two pages, we can see that the Green Lantern has trapped the crime syndicate into the moon with the construct of two hands holding them from getting out. Superman puts on a fake mustache and goes to the Daily Planet building posing as his local self, who according to the local version of Cat Grant is an astronaut with an army rank of a lieutenant. Or actually, Luthor said earlier that Ultraman used to be a human who got stranded on a space mission and some alien race augmented him with superpowers. So if Ultraman is not a Kryptonian like Superman, then why do they still look like the same person? Next, Superwoman is revealed to not only be an evil version of Wonder Woman, but rather... If she is the local evil version of Wonder Woman, then for this next revelation, I can only assume that she probably killed and stole the identity of Lois Lane. Superman leaves her a message with heat vision to make her believe Ultraman wants to see her at his floating fortress, where upon arriving, Luthor confronts her with the Justice League, who then overpower her and throw her into a teleporter to send her trapped on their moon base with the others. With the crime syndicate now locked up in their moon base, the Justice League addresses the world they have oppressed and let them know that their tyranny will be over as they have arrived to set them free. Luthor then sends a holographic call to the crime syndicate who are also able to see the address to rub it on their faces more, but Owlman seems to have recognized a flaw in Luthor bringing the Justice League to their world. Over the course of the next few pages, we are then shown how the Justice League is working on what Wonder Woman calls humanitarian aid by fixing rundown buildings, providing emergency food, refusing to take bribes from the world leaders, and stopping wars. In Gotham, Batman helps Commissioner Wayne take down organized crime that no longer has Owlman to protect them, and saves his father from an assassination as the crime boss Jim Gordon is arrested. And then when Batman tells Commissioner Wayne that his team will be leaving soon after setting a better example, Commissioner Wayne says that he is going to build a wall around Gotham while waiting for Owlman to be turned in for a trial and execution. Look at the disappointment on Batman's face. In the moon, Ultraman rants about wanting to spend five minutes with Wonder Woman, and Owlman finally reveals the flaw in Luthor's plan in bringing the Justice League over. The plane we saw the Justice League try to save early in the story was from the crime syndicate's world, and while they were brought over, an another plane from the Justice League's world crossed over into the crime syndicate's world. There were cosmic scales balancing between the two worlds before the Justice League arrived, and with them now in crime syndicate's world, Owlman tells his teammates that it's almost the time when they will be sent into the Justice League's world. There were no repercussions for Luthor's there and back trip because he came back in less than 24 hours. But when 24 hours have passed since the Justice League's arrival, the crime syndicate crosses over to balance the scales. Their departure is seen as a priority for the Justice League to return, which is visibly shown to stress Luthor out as his plan has begun to fall apart. In the Justice League's world, Martian Manhunter and Aquaman respond to the crime syndicate's rampage mostly happening in Washington DC, and they appear to be able to overpower them rather easily. Like, look how easily Aquaman is able to defeat Poetry. Martian Manhunter's victory over Ultraman is explained by Superwoman as him being powered by anti-kryptonite left in their world, and him becoming weaker by the second as long as he is separated from it. And Superwoman herself is defeated by Jean just telling her, Be gone, pot. At the gravesite of Thomas and Martha Wayne, Owlman shows what looks like genuine signs of grief over both his parents being dead in this world. He however claims it for being not being able to hurt his father now how he has been doing it in his world, and tells Johnny Quick to go tell the others they need to get back to their world. 
In the crime syndicate's world, Luthor and the Flash are trying to recharge the reversal engine used to cross over between the worlds, and realize that the two planes that crossed over first could have been a test that never had anything to do with Luthor crossing over. With the crime syndicate having crossed over passively 24 hours after the Justice League arrived, the Flash theorizes that the machine Luthor used might have been used by someone else to test it with the two planes before Luthor decided to get the Justice League to help. And that someone is then revealed to be the local version of Brainiac that the Ultraman had forced into his servitude and is revealed to be rebelling against those using him, including Luthor. Brainiac subdues him while declaring his independence and upcoming upgrade before the Flash saves Luthor quickly by disabling the drones. But since those were just drones, Brainiac is still free to explain what his plan is in manipulating Luthor into bringing the Justice League to the Antimatter Earth and so sending the crime syndicate to the Matter Earth. Both Earths can now be seen by each other on their skies as the two worlds are about to collide which with the matter and antimatter would cause destruction of both while Brainiac would evolve, probably in surviving and witnessing that. The two thieves of the two worlds react to this by realizing that they cannot operate like they are used to in the opposite worlds, and that they have to return back to their home worlds to balance the scales as Luthor begs Brainiac not to cause the deaths of billions, that the 12th level intellect apathically deems irrelevant. Superman charges at Brainiac's main body, while the Flash tries to recharge the reverse engine to switch the Justice League and the crime syndicate's places on the two Earths. But then Brainiac's main body is revealed to be organic instead of technological, and Superman is morally unable to kill a sentient being. Brainiac sends a kryptonite-powered Titano to attack Superman, but Wonder Woman and Green Lantern arrive to deal with it by sending it to the bodiless limbo that is the Phantom Zone. Brainiac still declares, but to having won, as in the antimatter universe, evil wins by default, and the Justice League cannot win as the good guys. So, they do the only evil thing they can do in this situation, and walk away from the crisis as they finally switch places with the crime syndicate, who return back to their world, and Ultraman is not morally unable to kill Brainiac. The Justice League witnesses as the antimatter Earth dismaterializes on their sky as they begin to fix the damages caused by the crime syndicate in Washington DC and talk about their experience. They comment that the antimatter Earth is doomed to keep being the hellhole by default and not because of the crime syndicate's presence. They were the symptoms of the nature of their world, not the cause of it, and as that world keeps turning around, all the changes the Justice League did in trying to fix it will be undone to how they were before their visit there. The story ends where it began by showing this as Johnny Quick and Power Ring are back to extorting bribes for the president, Luthor being reported to being on the run, and with Ultraman, Old Man and Superwoman in a situation best represented by this edit I made. Fucking my wife. I'm going to, okay? JLA Earth 2 was a quick and short read that was so densely written slash edited that it wasn't until I sat down to write the plot synopsis until I managed to properly understand how it ended. Frank Wintley's art was also somewhat flawed compared to how it has been visibly improving since the year 2000. The story was also not very much to talk about outside of being the modern introduction of the crime syndicate and to establish that they exist in a world where everyone is evil by default of their world's nature. Again, they are the symptoms of the way how their world works, not the other way around. The Justice League was unable to go over there, take them out and change things because that was the way how their world works. That was something that Grant Morrison carried over from the original Justice League of America issue 29, while also keeping Luthor as the only hero of the world. And Brainiac was essentially a neutral party who didn't care about either, and was so able to threaten both worlds. However, Morrison added some of Hedden own changes in making Ultraman originally be a human Clark Kent who was turned into an augmented superhuman powered by anti-kryptonite 
and by making Owlman be Batman's non-existent older brother instead of an evil Bruce Wayne. That latter change was something that I as an older brother myself have come to see as an underutilized revelation because the story establishes that Owlman genuinely loved his mother and brother who died and blames their deaths on his father who did survive. So if Owlman knows that his brother is alive as Batman, why has he never been written in future stories in trying to confront Batman and have any kind of discussion as brothers? Mark Wade wrote a follow-up story in the early 2000s where the crime syndicate came back to Justice League's Earth to fuck shit up. And there, Owlman openly acknowledges Batman as his brother, but that does not lead to anything. After Infinite Crisis, there was another crime syndicate called Crime Society that existed in a new multiverse along with the Antimatter Crime Syndicate. And then after the New 52 happened, there was a hybrid of both introduced in the Forever Evil story that was pretty much the same as the one in Morrison's story. And that Owlman was also a Thomas Wayne Jr. who had a brother named Bruce, but instead of trying to convince Batman to join him as his brother, that Owlman was more interested in doing that to Nightwing. And recently there was another Earth 3 crime syndicate introduced after Dark Knight's Death Metal, who were just parodies of their former incarnations that Amanda Waller and the Suicide Squad decided to overthrow because they were weaker than the original crime syndicate. For fuck's sake, DC. Okay, and now let's talk about the animated movie inspired by this comic. Justice League Crisis on Two Earths came out in February 2010, was written by the late Dwayne McDuffie and directed by Laurent Montgomery and Sam Liu. It was originally worked as a direct-to-video feature Justice League Worlds Collide, which was intended as a bridge between the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited cartoon series, before it was reworked to remove all references to the two cartoons continuity. Few examples of this are the absence of Hawk Girl, Green Lantern being switched from Jon Stewart to Hal Jordan, and by introducing the Justice League in the middle of building their new watchtower that has teleporters built on it. Otherwise, Cries on Two Earths is told as more of an inspired adaptation like the Snyder Cut of the Justice League as to the New 52's origin story in borrowing certain plot elements here and there. For example, the movie begins by showing Luthor stealing the needed technology to cross over from his world and making him the only hero of his world by killing off a heroic version of the Joker. He arrives at the Justice League's world quite showingly, but is arrested when trying to find super people, because in 2010, Luthor was no longer a legitimate businessman, but rather a villain and in prison. The Justice League picks him up from police custody and homaging Morrison's GLA Earth 2, see that his heart is on the right side of his body, before taking him to the Watchtower to tell them about the crime syndicate's tyranny. However, something that Morrison never brought up in JLA Earth 2 is that apparently the movie version of the crime syndicate is held back from going too far in their tyranny is the nuclear response. The only thing keeping them from completely overthrowing the government is the threat of a nuclear response. The Justice League holds the same discussion in voting on the matter, with Batman once again saying no and staying behind in their world while the rest of the Justice League decides to cross over to the other world and help Luthor. During their meeting, Luthor also hides a piece of technology called the Quantum Trigger to the Watchtower. Going forward from this point, the movie is pretty much its own story independent from JLA Earth 2, with action sequences where the Justice League has to fight villainous versions of the heroes they know as underlings of the crime syndicate, and Brainiac's apathetic behind-the-scenes role as the main antagonist being incorporated into Owlman being a suicidal nihilist. Most of the crime syndicate are also voiced by different voice actors, completely destroying the immersion that they are evil versions of the Justice League. Ultraman, for example, is voiced by Brian Bloom, opposite to Superman being voiced by Mark Harmon, and he behaves like an Italian mobster while being weak to Blue Kryptonite as if he was bizarro. Owlman is voiced by James Woods with William Baldwin as Batman, 
which would make sense if he was confirmed or implied to be Thomas Wayne Jr. instead of an evil Bruce Wayne. But this movie does not even bother to delve into exploring the CSA members' backstories at all. Superwoman voiced by Gina Torres, on the other hand, is all but confirmed not to be an evil Wonder Woman who stole Lois Lane's identity, but rather has her be an evil grown-up version of Mary Marvel, as shown by having her underlings be evil version of Captain Marvel, aka Sam, Freddie Freeman and Uncle Donnelly. And instead of being married to Ultraman while cheating on him with Owlman, Superwoman was apparently in a committed and intimate relationship with Owlman alone. Powerning is not even implied to have a sentient ring that he is cursed to carry with Vault Hope tormenting him, and Johnny Quick is another speedster just like the Flash, except he has an Australian accent. Then there is a device that Owlman has created to destroy the entire planet that the crime syndicate decides to use to blackmail their world leaders to surrender all their power to them. The movie also throws away that the crime syndicate's world has a evil thrives by default nature, by having good versions of Deathstroke and Ravager doing what Luthor tried to do in JLA Earth 2, which shows that the filmmakers had an obvious bias in having the movie's narrative be Good triumphs over evil all times! Martian Manhunter and this good version of Ravager have a, some form of romance in the movie, but we all know that they have to get separated by the time he returns back to his world. Then there was something that was established during the Infinite Crisis as a sort of rule, where Kryptonite from other different worlds should not have any effect on Kryptonians from separate worlds, by having Luthor and Superman overpower Ultraman in a pointless battle with blue kryptonite from a different Earth. The final conflict of the movie then has it operate on the pre-crisis multiverse rules, by having an uncountable number of parallel universes spawn from every choice ever made, and that being the basis behind Owlman's nihilism. Which he plans to deal with by finding the original world where they all spawn from, and destroying it under the logic of destroying the entire multiverse as the only action that has any meaning behind it. And Superwoman simps over him for this course of action. In building that device and re-engineering Luthor's crossover device, Owlman then sends Superwoman to pick up the quantum trigger Luthor left to the Watchtower, and that is how Batman ends up being dragged into the Crime Syndicate's world too. At Superwoman's mercy, Batman has to hold on until he manages to trick Superwoman into swallowing anesthetic gas that she first assumes to be a smoke bomb and calls the Justice League to know that he is in the crime syndicate's world too. Once they have arrived, Batman forces Luthor to tell what he hid on the watchtower that Superwoman came to pick up, and they all learn that it is the trigger to Old Man's bomb that could destroy all life on Earth. But Superwoman snitches that Owlman plans to use it to destroy the multiverse. Which he can now do since Superwoman got him the quantum trigger. That leads us to the final two climactic fights on the Crime Syndicate's moon base, where the Justice League and the CSA end up having a bunch of mirror battles against their counterparts. This lasts up until Owlman manages to defeat his little brother long enough to use the crossover device to find the original world where all the parallel worlds in the multiverse spawn from and crosses over there with his mom. Revealing Owlman's plan to the rest of the crime syndicate, they form a temporary truce where following Owlman to the original worlds needs to have the Flash. I'm your man. No, you're not. You're too slow. What? I know your limitations. You can't possibly reach the speed necessary to pull this off. No, I can. No, Johnny Quick vibrate to find the frequency to get past Owlman's block to send only Batman after his big brother. I'm next. You don't have a transit device. You'd be torn apart by the event horizon. And even when I refer to them as such, the movie still does not acknowledge them as such which is a huge missed opportunity that could have avoided in turning the version of Batman in this movie from becoming a calculating murderer. During their predictable fight, Owlman manages to profile Batman's personality and life story from his appearance and behavior, which he likely shares with him. This could have made Owlman see Batman as an another version of himself, but if during their fight they were to unmask each other, 
Owlman could have as Thomas Jr. recognized that Batman was his dead younger brother, whose death along with their mother sent him out to become the supervillain he is. Similarly as in the BVS's Martha moment, this could have caused Owlman to freeze in seeing his dead brother again, and given Batman the chance to overpower Owlman, defuse the bomb, send it to blow up on an uninhabited world, and return to the others with the defeated Owlman before Johnny Quick dies out of exhausting in keeping the portal open. But no. Instead, Batman and Owlman fight a long fight until the bomb's countdown is almost at its end, and Batman manages to tie Owlman to it before sending both to a frozen world while quoting Nietzsche. We both looked into the abyss, but when it looked back at us, you blinked. And the nihilist show has death via inaction. It doesn't matter. Then Batman returns to the crime syndicate's world, Johnny Quick dies from having kept the portal open, and Batman is now responsible for his death for having pushed him into the job instead of the Flash. Then Martian Manhunter arrives with President Deathstroke, and the US Marines come to arrest the crime syndicate. Even without Owlman and Johnny Quick, the crime syndicate could still overpower them and tell the Justice League to piss off from their world, but no! This is one of those movies where a happy ending where the bad guys are defeated was mandatory. Martian Manhunter and Ravager have to say goodbye as they leave, and Wonder Woman took Owlman's jet that was stuck on stealth mode, so becoming her invisible jet. The movie then ends with the leftover elements from the Justice League World Collide movie in leading to the Justice League Unlimited cartoon, in having Batman suggest that they invite other heroes whom he called to help him fight against Superwoman into the Justice League. Pretty much like how I said in the Superman Batman Public Enemies video. Justice League Rides on Two Earths was one of those many overrated movies drowned under quantity of similar animated movies. At least it was its own original story without changing the ending to be original. But that story goes on a safe route of the heroes coming to change what they see needing to be fixed, and deeming the crime syndicate as the cause of their world's problems without even considering the fact that they could be the symptoms of those problems. The crime syndicate was also pretty much just nerfed from how they were shown in the JLA Earth 2, and the only way how they were shown to be bad guys was in their on-screen portrayals along with their voice acting. For example, in JLA Earth 2, Ultraman was shown trying to destabilize the economy by making it rain with fake money, Owlman actively engaged against the police, Powerling and Johnny Quick were shown taking protection money from the government, and the Superwoman actually killed, threatened to kill, and dominated people clearly weaker than her. This movie wasted time with Martian Manhunter and the Good Ravager short-lived slash doom romance that could have been used to properly establish the crime syndicate as actually threatening villains, and could have given some three-dimensional character development to them. Have Ultraman kill someone for defying him? Owlman interact with someone outside the syndicate, or show us some flashbacks of how their origin stories were dark reflections of the Justice Leagues. After you have watched the movie, there is little reason to rewatch it outside of the pretty well choreographed and fast paced fight sequences. The Batman vs. Owlman fight, for example, can be found on multiple videos on YouTube. But I already said how it could have been much better in acknowledging Morrison's recreation from JLA Earth 2 in having Batman overpower Owlman psychologically in having them learn to be brothers. And it wouldn't have even needed to be because of that, like I said. Just have Owlman freeze in seeing his dead brother alive in Batman, and Batman take advantage from Owlman freezing. In the end, I don't even see why this movie couldn't have been the DCAU direct-to-video film set between the Justice League and the JLU cartoons, as it opened from the end of the former with the Justice League building a new watchtower, and ended with them starting to expand the league with the new members like in the latter. It could have fit well as it also explained where Wonder Woman got her invisible jet that she was just shown to have gotten from somewhere in the GLU cartoon. 
Otherwise, I think this was all I could think to say about JLA Earth 2 and the Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Both are stories that have to do one thing, and they did it. But the comic left a door open for future stories, and the movie knew nothing was going to come after it. And that is why the movie is yet another watch once and wait really long time before you think to watch it again. Like or dislike, if you agree or disagree, comment with your thoughts about the comic and the movie down below, share this video for other people to see, and subscribe for other videos I will have coming in the future. Also, ding the bell so you can be in the audience when I do gameplay streams, and may your heart be your guiding key.